campaigns organised with Nautilus International, which is the Maritime Officers Trade Union. Um, he started with Nautilus in January 2022. And before that, he was an organiser for the Royal College of Midwives in the north of England. And before that, was president of the National Union of Students in Northern Ireland from 2019 to 2020. So, Robert, you're very welcome. And over to you. And we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. Can you see that OK? Yeah. And if I just Thanks. move this down here, then I'll be able to see it myself. OK, perfect. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much, uh, Andrew, and thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you for uh, inviting me to, to be with you this evening. Um, I know that you want to talk about the, this casualization uh, of, of labour um, and how unions are responding. What, what I thought the best way to, to do this is to sort of um, talk specifically about p &O ferries, partly because that's what I'm qualified to talk about, but also because I think it offers a good sort of um, sounding board for further conversations that you guys will have around your own experience uh, within your unions of wider issues around casualization of labor. So if it's okay with you, I'm gonna sort of focus specifically on PO ferries, but obviously happy to answer any questions on, on wider issues and, and definitely part of that, uh, that discussion later on as well. <clears throat> So some uh, background information, I should actually start off with background information about Nautilus, as, as was mentioned, Nautilus, uh, we are the union uh, for maritime professionals, uh, we represent 20,000 uh, maritime professionals across uh, the UK, Netherlands and Switzerland, but we have members uh, of over 70 different uh, nationalities. Traditionally, uh, our, our, our membership would have come from the Merchant Navy, but obviously over time, um, things have changed. We also represent members in the super yacht industry uh, uh, as well, and obviously members working in, in offshore wind farms and traditionally as well in, in, in oil and gas offshore as well. So 20,000 uh, members across the UK, Netherlands uh, and Switzerland. Now into p &O Ferries, so a bit of background information about p &O Ferries. So p &O Ferries has operated uh, passenger vessels in British waters since 1844. Um, I'm sure you'll know it's such a recognisable brand, a, a British sort of brand, that, that sort of white, red, blue, yellow, very distinct uh, uh, brand that has been around for many, many years. Uh, their CEO is a man called Mr. Peter Hebblethwaite, who we will talk extensively about uh, throughout uh, the next 20, 25 minutes. Uh, Piano Ferries was bought over by DP World uh, in 2019. DP World is a subsidiary of Dubai World, and Dubai World is a state owned investment company uh, in uh, Dubai, which is why uh, you will have seen protests outside DP World uh, headquarters. And again, uh, some of the, the actions that we have carried out have been in relation to DP World uh, and not just Piano Ferries. So that's the, the sort of background uh, information as to who Piano uh, are. Uh, the routes and the vessels that were affected uh, uh, in terms of this particular case. So there were four routes that were affected, the Kernran to Larne route, um, which was run by the European Causeway and the European Highlander, uh, the Liverpool to Dublin route, which was the Norbay, the Dover to Calais route, which was the, the Pride of Kent. I think these are really fascinating names, um, sort of uh, uh, ironic names, the Pride of Kent, the Spirit of Britain, the Pride of Canterbury, the Spirit of France, the Pride of Hull. Uh, and of course, we, we've jumped on that and called them ships of shame, the, the, uh, the shame of Britain, the shame of Canterbury, the shame of France. Uh, but those were the vessels that were affected uh, during, this, um, uh, uh, during this sort of saga, this ongoing uh, issue. Um, so on the actual day itself, so as we mentioned before, uh, I am Irish and I am proud to be Irish uh, and I'm sure many of you will recognise the date of the 17th uh, of March. It is of course St Patrick's Day, uh, so quite a big uh, uh, event for me, but this was the St Patrick's Day uh, like no others. It has been nicknamed the St Patrick's Day Massacre because it was the day that 786 seafarers were dismissed by pre-recorded video message by p and Ferries. And I'll just see if this if this plays. Therefore, I am sorry to inform you that this means your employment is terminated with immediate effect on the grounds of redundancy. Did you hear that? It might have been a bit low, but did, did you sort of manage to get it? So in that video, we have nine seconds. 
Nine seconds is all it took for p and ferries to destroy the livelihoods of 786 seafarers. Nine seconds is all it took for p and ferries to not only destroy the livelihoods uh, of those individuals, but as we know behind those individuals, there are families and there are communities that will continue uh, to feel the effects as well. And not just the seafarers, nine seconds is all it took for p and ferries to destroy the reputation that they had built up over centuries, since 1844. That reputation was now uh, in tatters. And I think there's a really uh, uh, sort of nefarious aspect to all of this, the fact that it was done by pre-recorded message. p and ferries couldn't even look our members in the eyes and tell them that were, they were dismissed. And I also thought it was quite ironic during the, the pandemic, and as, as we were sort of talking about before we started here, uh, we used Zoom and Teams and all the rest of it to keep in contact. When we were told to, to stay away from our friends and family, we used Zoom and all the rest of it to try and, trans, you know, stay with our families, try and keep connected. But here we have p and ferries using that tool that had brought joy in what were very difficult times, using that same method to destroy the livelihoods of 786 seafarers. It was absolutely shameless on behalf of p and ferries. So not only did p and ferries dismiss without consultation and without notice, which I'll, we'll come on and talk about, via recorded uh, message, when the crew decided that they wouldn't leave the vessels, because not only was this their workplace, but for many of these crews, they live on these vessels for weeks on end. The crew said we wouldn't leave. p and ferries then decided to employ security personnel, some that were handcuffed trained. We have eyewitnesses that told us that some uh, were, were in balaclavas, brought them on board to force the crew off their vessels. So just a very short uh, snippet. But this is what our crew were facing. Not only had they just lost their jobs, but now they were being treated as common criminals. But folks, it wasn't our members that broke the law. It wasn't our members who breached UK employment law. It was P&O ferries, and yet our members were being treated as common criminals. So the question that everyone then asked themselves is, how did P&O do it? How did this happen? Surely there are laws that stop this type of thing from happening. And you're right, there is laws to stop this from happening. So let's talk about the first one, which is the duty to notify. Under the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act of 1992, there's a duty for employers to notify the Secretary of State ahead of making redundancies of over 100 people. p &O didn't do this, okay? So let's look, this, this is where we're looking at the facts of the case, right? I'm not a lawyer, but I know what lawyers do. They look at the facts and they look at the remedy. So let's look at the facts of the case. p &O didn't notify the Secretary of State. They admitted themselves they didn't notify the Secretary of State. There's no debate over that. And that's under Section 193 of the Trade Union Labour Relations Act. Section 193A, which was an amendment in 2018, confers a duty for shipping companies to notify the competent authority of the flag state. So I'm, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, vessels, ships will have a flag state, right? That's the state that the ship is registered to. In this case, we're dealing with three flag states, Bermuda, Bahamas and Cyprus. So p and ferries were under an obligation in British law to inform the competent authority in, the, in Bermuda, in the Bahamas and in Cyprus ahead of the redundancies. They did not do this. Again, fact, p and admitted they didn't do this. So the, 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 the enforcement mechanism is section 194. Section 194 lays out very clearly that failure to notify is a criminal offence that can lead to a penalty of an unlimited fine. So straightforward case, you would think, but of course, like everything in the law, it's a bit more ambiguous. p and argue that they, that, well, they haven't necessarily said this publicly, but you know, by implication, they're, they're, they argue that they aren't under an obligation under section 193. They are under an obligation under section 193A to notify the competent authority in the flag state. But their argument is that section 194, the enforcement mechanism, 
doesn't actually apply to section 193A because it doesn't explicitly say. So if you look at the wording of section 194, it only says that the enforcement mechanism applies to section 193 and not section 193A. And there is a principle within criminal law that it has to be explicit. Now we, we, we believe that it doesn't matter, right? The section 193A was brought in to extend the rights of seafarers not to take rights away. So section 193A was about bringing into harmony legislation across Europe that uh, 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 shipping companies would have to notify the competent authority in uh, the, the uh, uh, flag state. Pino didn't do this. So you have to read section 193A with section 193 and therefore the enforcement mechanism the criminal sanction still applies. And it's not just us saying it, there's a professor of labor law at Bristol University, uh, who you may have seen give evidence to the select committee, a guy called Professor Alan Bogg, and he agrees with us that that enforcement mechanism does apply. And it's not just our opinion, the insolvency service are pursuing a criminal investigation. So there is clearly a question here, a legal question over uh, whether PO ferries have broken the law. It's not a straightforward question, but there is a question. So there is an ambiguity in the law that we want to see in the future clarified, and I'll come on to talk about that a bit later. So this is the first issue, a bit of an ambiguity in the law and on, on, over the duty to notify. The second issue is on the duty to consult. Section 188 of the Trade Union Labour Relations Consolidation Act very clearly sets out a duty for employers to, meet, to meaningfully consult workers ahead of making redundancies. The enforcement mechanism under this section is section 189. And this is where the issue is. So failure to result, or sorry, failure to consult can result in a protective award for the individual capped at 90 days. And that's awarded through an employment tribunal. So if I'm a worker and I'm not, and I'm made redundant and I'm not consulted in the right time beforehand, then I can take the case to an employment tribunal and the most that I can get is a protective award which is capped at 90 days. And this is the crux of the issue. What p Ferries did was essentially cost how much it would cost them to go through this process because of the cap of 90 days. And rather than you know, get all their workers to go through an employment tribunal process, they basically said, we know if you go through that process, you'll win. So rather to save everyone's time, we're just going to pay you uh, what the 90 day protective award would be. So p and Ferry said that they were given enhanced redundancies. That is nonsense. They were given out what they would have had to pay had they gone through an employment tribunal process. But the issue here is that the law isn't ambiguous, but it isn't strong enough. Because as I say, what these companies can simply do is factor in how much it will cost them not to consult. So the law needs to change, right? And perhaps we need to look at that cap of 90 days, perhaps that cap needs to be lifted or the cap needs to be uh, increased. But the fact of the matter is that p and Ferries, when they sat around their shareholder meetings and their, their executive meetings and they decided that they were going to let off 786 seafarers and the issue that they would face in, in terms of the opposition from the unions, they simply said, well, rather than face that opposition, we'll just pay our way out of the law. So the law isn't strong enough. And again, I'll come on to talk about remedies for this uh, in a bit. So on, on the back of this, then we have a select committee hearing, which if any of you have seen the footage, it really is astounding. But I'm going to play one bit, which is from Andy McDonald questioning Peter Hebblethwaite, the CEO uh, of uh, p and Ferries. Now, uh, I'm not sure if, if the actual video will play. Hopefully, you'll, you, if the video doesn't play, you'll still be able to hear the sound. Um, so I'm just going to play it and you might want to turn the sound up as well on your on your own device. A duty to consult the unions in good time or the redundancies pursuant to section 188 of the uh, Trade Union Act of 1992. There's absolutely no doubt that we were required to consult with the unions. We chose not to do that because we believe... We chose to break the law. Because... We chose not to consult and we will come and we are and will compensate everybody in full for that. I recognise that this is a really... When difficult... you get in your car and drive down the motorway and you see the 70 mile an hour sign, do you say that that's not going to apply to me, I'm going to do 90 uh, because I think it's important that I do that? Is that how you go about your life? No, no it isn't. Did the collective agreements in place between P&O and RNT 
and Nautilus provide for negotiation over such matters as redundancies. All right, could you rephrase the question? Do, you had collective agreements Correct. with RMT and, P, uh, 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 and Nautilus. That provides for negotiation over such matters of redundancies. You've done it before. Why didn't you do it? What was the moral justification for you not doing that? Okay, so this is these are very extreme circumstances. Let me can I in order to answer that question fully, can I explain the difference between the operation uh, model that we previously had and the one that we are moving to, so that you understand how fundamental a change it is, and that helps me explain why we had to take the route we had to take. Would you allow me I'm to sorry, as the, as the chair has already pointed out, there's many companies that have difficulties. They obey the law and they consult with their, with their members through, through their trade unions. You haven't done that. We've moved from one operating model to another. And you, haven't, you haven't escaped the law of this country. You've still got to do it within the legal framework. You can't just decide that you're going to absent yourself from the legal system of the United Kingdom. It, is, it was our assessment that the change was of such a magnitude that no union could possibly accept our proposal. Oh, you're and right about that. that that's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> no union could possibly accept our proposals. So in the first bit, he admits that he did have a duty to consult. He then says that they compensated for that. Let's be clear, it's not compensation, right? It's what the workers would be entitled to if they had gone through an employment tribunal process. And then he says, no union could possibly accept our proposals. Well, let's be clear. And if Mr. Hebblethwaite was in front of me, I'd say right now, there's a reason why the union wouldn't accept your proposals. And I, th I just want to mention one thing because I think this is some, and, and you know, I think we're all trade unionists in this room. And there's one thing that I think um, the public often misconstrue uh, about trade unions, but you will know it as well as I do. We don't want companies to go bust because when companies go bust, it's our members that lose jobs. So it's not in our interest to see any company go bust. It's not in our interest to, to uh, let P&O's financial situation deteriorate so much. We can play a constructive role that helps to protect jobs, but also keeps a business viable. And that's the argument that we would be making to Mr. Hebblethwaite. But let's be very clear about this. The reason why the union couldn't possibly accept the proposals is because of the crew model that p and Ferries decided to move to. They replaced the 786 seafarers with exploited foreign agency crew from Eastern Europe, from India, from Central America, employed through a company called International Ferries Management, which is a Maltese-based crewing agency that only formed in February 2022. And as far as we know, the only company that they work with is p and Ferries. Some of the agency crew were paid less than national minimum wage. And that's really important, but also it's not the only issue, uh, which again, I'll come on to talk about in terms of government response. 91 seafarers were asked to re-engage with p and Ferries. Senior officers asked to re-engage with p and Ferries because p and realized that they couldn't operate without the skills and the talents of some of the more senior officers. But of course, they were asked to re-engage through IFM with lesser terms and conditions, but with a promise of a package at the end of 12 months. And if IFM is still in existence in 12 months, then I'll eat my hat. So the issue here is the, the new crew model is totally based on exploitation. But there's another issue at the crux of this and another issue that not less we've been banging home about. And that's the issue of safety, both initially in terms of the immediate safety of p &O vessels, but also the longer term issues of safety. Because not only are these foreign agency crew employed on poverty wages, less than the national minimum wage, they're also being employed on far longer tours of duty. And there has been significant research that has been done that has shown the longer terms of duty and the issues that fatigue has on health and safety. In terms of shipping, one of the most dangerous places in shipping is on the, the, the vehicle decks on ferry, on, on, on uh, ferry vessels. Fatigue and health and safety go hand in hand. And yet PO ferries want to keep these foreign crew on their vessels for months on end.
months on end when they won't see any land. You look at the Dover to Calais route, right? That's a constant back and forward. These crew will not get any time, barely any time, if any time, to set foot on land. So not only is that a health and safety issue for the crew, it's also a health and safety issue for the passengers on board vessels that are crewed by, by, by crew who are suffering from fatigue. So the whole point, and they can talk about a new crewing model. This is an exploitative crewing model that is designed to undercut British wages for British seafarers, to stop British seafarers from being able to compete for these jobs, to pay foreign-based uh, agency crew less than the minimum wage, and also to provide them longer uh, uh, tours of duty. So it's not just pay, it's conditions uh, as well. And on the issue of safety, and I, I'm going to play the video again. This probably won't play the actual video, but you'll still be able to hear it. It's only 50 seconds. But this is the evidence that our General Secretary, Mark Dickinson, uh, gave to the Select Committee uh, a couple of days after p and Ferry's decision. ...issue of whether these vessels can, with a new crew or with a substantial number of replacement crew being drafted in to replace the Saxe Seafarers, whether uh, they can be readied in, in a matter of days to conduct and reintroduce those services in a safe way. And we do not believe that that can, that can, be, can be done. There are obviously uh, international uh, rules about these issues, SDCW, Standards of Training and Convention, Watchkeeping Convention from the IMO, there's the International <laughs> Safety Management Code, ISM Code. Our estimation, our view, but actually in the scenario that we are facing, it could take months, not days, to prepare a crew uh, to safely operate those vessels. So Mark Dickinson there, uh, less than a week after p and Ferries make the decision, warning MPs that it would take months, not, even, not necessarily weeks, and definitely not days, as p and were initially estimating, before these vessels would be even close to, to be fit to set sail. And this, again, safety is at the heart of this issue. Operating a, a vessel uh, like, a, like a ferry is not the same as driving a car. You get into a car, you drive a new car, okay, it might take you a few minutes to get used to it, it might be a bit sticky, you might be going from an automatic to a manual. I don't drive, so I don't know from first-hand experience, but I'm told. Um, it's not the same uh, as uh, being in charge of a vessel. Every single vessel uh, is different. And it takes weeks, if not months, for the crew to be able to understand the vessel that they're working on, even from, from a PO vessel to another PO vessel. Every vessel is different. And there are international conventions, as Mark uh, outlined, that must be adhered to for crew operating the ferries. One of our initial demands when this, when this happened was that the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency uh, inspect every single PO vessel before it is before it sets sail, and they did that. Three PO vessels uh, were detained by the MCA over issues relating to safety, which meant it did take longer for PO to be able to uh, return to normal operations. One vessel, the Pride of Kent, was only released from detention yesterday after failing inspection three times. So, in the fourth time, not third time, lucky fourth time lucky that the Pride of Kent was actually uh, deemed fit to set sail. We warned this less than a week after this happened that this, that this was going to be the case. And p and ferries have shown time and time again that they are out of touch. On the 26th of April, which is, what, two weeks ago, a couple of days after the European Causeway was deemed fit to set sail by the MCA, uh, it had to be, it, it, was, it was left adrift in the Irish Sea, had to be brought back to port by tugs, and it was reportedly because the Jew, who were inexperienced, didn't follow proper procedure when changing over generators. Now, it was lucky that this ended safely, but if this was in bad weather, if it was closer to shore, uh, if it was in a busier shipping lane, that could have ended in disaster. So there are serious questions over the safety of P&O ferries vessels. So those are all the facts of the case, right? 
none of this, none of this is, 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 is just my view. None of it is hearsay. This is all the facts of the case. So let me talk about our campaign and the remedy, so to speak. So initially our response, of course, was to get support and advice to the members affected uh, through our, our in-house legal team and also our external legal team. We engaged extensively with the print and broadcast media. I'm sure many of you have seen it. We were, I mean, quite literally uh, uh, bombarded uh, with media requests. I, I was in London at the time and my team, the comms and campaigns team, we sort of formed a, a sort of crisis response group. Um, uh, it felt a bit like the, the you know, that scene um, with, with Barack Obama when they're going in to try and find Osama bin Laden. We were sort of stuck in a room with a, with a video screen, just trying to watch everything that was going on. So we, we went straight into crisis management mode. We started creating content for social media, for our news stories. We uh, uh, went to protests in Dover, Liverpool, Hull, London, Kernan, Larne. And on the 19th of March, we wrote to the Transport Secretary which are outlining our initial asks to hold p ferries legally accountable, to end the government contracts, and for the MCA to inspect uh, vessels, and also to end fire and rehire. And there was some people suggesting this wasn't fire and rehire. 91 senior officers were asked to re-engage with the company through IFM. So there was fire and rehire uh, involved uh, in this case. We engaged with MPs from, from across the chamber. Um, we, obviously, we had quite a lot of, of political support. And as I mentioned, our General Secretary gave evidence to the Select Committee. And one of the things I must admit that I'm so proud of, and as a Manchester United fan, uh, it sort of kills me, but one of the things that I'm most proud of uh, in terms of our campaigning is we even had the Liverpool fans uh, display a banner in the cop end during a Premier League game that read, Seafarers are not a bank balance, United we stand. It's very clear that there was public outrage, right? From all corners uh, of, of society, people were outraged at this action. We even saw um, uh, Alan Partridge joke about it on, on, on the Anton Deck Saturday Night Takeaway. Uh, Alan Partridge said, I'm gonna mention that uh, company, that, that ferry company you told me not to mention. So, the, and it was also mentioned in Have I Got News For You. So there was clear, there was a lot of public culture. And it obviously wasn't all us, the RMT uh, very much at the forefront as well. And, and I should say, we did work very closely uh, with the RMT and we continue to work closely uh, with the RMT, the other union uh, affected. So that was our sort of initial immediate response. It was all about getting the message out publicly, engaging uh, with, with MPs and with uh, uh, government to try and make sure the penal ferries would be held properly uh, accountable. So the government response. So immediately the government announced a review into contracts with PO ferries. We think the government need to go further. They need to review the contracts with DP World that I mentioned, the parent company. Uh, the insolvency service has announced it is pursuing both criminal and civil investigations against PO ferries. Again, a welcome move. And we will obviously, uh, if we're asked to, we will contribute uh, to those investigations. On the 30th of March, government announced through Grant Shapps, the transport secretary, uh, the nine point plan in response to PO ferries. And Grant Shapps, in his own words, said that this was about forcing PO ferries to rethink and ensuring this can never happen again. The focus of this nine point plan was the issue of national minimum wage, expanding national minimum wage coverage to all seafarers operating in UK waters. Now, I've, as we've gone through tonight, you can realise that national minimum wage is but one issue in a whole load of issues relating to what p ferries did. So the issue around national minimum wage is not enough. And the government's response is not enough. And today we saw in the Queen's speech the uh, government introducing legislation uh, 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 in relation to national minimum wage. Let's be very clear about this, folks. If you're operating on uh, Kernan to Larne, UK to UK port, domestic uh, legislation on national minimum wage already applies. If you're operating on a Dover to Calais or Hull to Rotterdam or Liverpool to Dublin, domestic legislation cannot cover for the national minimum wage. So government cannot, through domestic legislation, apply national minimum wage to seafarers coming into the UK. Well, that's not actually quite true. They can. But the issue is, and what we already know, is what, what the, the ferry companies will do is pay the, 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 the workers national minimum wage in UK waters, but when they're in other waters where there is no enforcement, they will simply pay them less. So the CFER isn't going to see any difference, right? Now, government have said that they're going to work in bilateral agreements 
with other European countries. And we look forward to seeing the detail on that because that will be critical. European and international cooperation will be critical. But this issue isn't just about national minimum wage. Our members were not on national minimum wage. Our members were covered through collective bargaining agreements, union negotiated rates of pay, reflective of their responsibilities and their duties. And this is where our key argument is coming in. So Nautilus alongside the RMT and some industry representatives, and that's important, some representatives of employers have worked with us to develop our Fair Ferries National Framework Agreement. And this is a legislative framework that would require ferry companies to enter into collective bargaining agreements with the unions, forcing ferry companies who operate in UK waters that they have to prove that they have a collective bargaining agreement with a social partner, with, with unions. And what we're asking government to do is to legislate, not only to enforce that, but also to set out minimum standards on two key issues, reliability and safety standards and employment conditions on the routes between UK and neighboring countries, reflecting local employment conditions, not international minimums, right? International minimums shouldn't be applied on short sea ferry crossings. Seafarers working in and around uh, uh, these waters where there is a, a, a roughly stand, you know, same standard of, of minimum wage shouldn't be paid ILO rates uh, of, of 190 or whatever it is, 180, can't remember off the top of my head, uh, per hour. So what we are calling for is this framework to be agreed in legislation to force companies uh, to abide by, by collective bargaining agreements and to set minimum standards for those collective bargaining agreements. What Pino Ferries have done is start a race to the bottom in the ferry sector. Mm. The government response won't change that. The only way government can fulfill their own ambition, which is to force Pino Ferries to rethink and to ensure this never happens again, is to legislate to create minimum standards and encourage a race to the top, not a race uh, to the bottom, to create a genuine level playing field, uh, to use the government's term to level up the ferry sector. So if government are serious about, about trying to achieve, uh, uh, trying to make sure this never happens again, then they need to work with us on these proposals because this is the only way it will happen. Other than that, it's not gonna happen. Minimum wage is not enough. It has to be uh, uh, employment conditions reflective of local uh, employment conditions. And it has to be about safety uh, of the crew as well. And let me just then sum up with, with one other thing because we mentioned at the start uh, a lot about the employment issues. But these employment issues aren't just for maritime professionals. These employment issues exist across the board. So I said about the duty to notify, the duty to consult. I, I also should have mentioned the issue around injunction. We did not have uh, 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 the ability to apply for an injunction to reverse the decision of PO Ferries. So that needs to change. So we're also going to work with our colleagues across the trade union movement in the trade union congress. Uh, to close the loopholes that p &O ferries have exposed. Governments have committed to an employment bill uh, in 2019 and so far have failed to live up to their own commitment. We need, as a, as a trade union movement, as trade unionists across the board, to keep the, the, the pressure on government to bring forward that employment bill that will include ending those loopholes, ending the cap on protective awards so that companies can no longer buy their way out of con consulting with unions allow for injunctive relief so that trade unions can apply for an injunction to compel companies to consult. If a trade union uh, took unlawful industrial action, an injunction would be applied straight away and that action would be reversed. Why are trade unions held to a higher standard than corporations? So we need to have an injunctive relief to allow courts to compel companies to consult and of course, we need to end the practice of fire and rehire. So we will continue to work with the TUC and across the trade union movement to make sure that in the proposals for an employment bill, that these loopholes are closed once and for all. And as we know, this is just a, a history, uh, a long history of attacks uh, on trade union rights uh, and uh, the ability for trade unions to hold employers to account. And we need to make sure that P&O Ferries is a turning point in industrial relations in this country. There is huge public support. We need to jump on that public support. We need to use that public support. And we need to use this populist government to see the public outrage 
and ensure once and for all that we turn the tide away from employers and on to workers and workers' representatives. So as I say, uh, we're working with RMT on the Fair Ferries National Framework uh, in terms specifically the ferry sector, but we'll, we'll also be working with our colleagues across the trade union movement to end the loopholes that p and ferries have brutally uh, exposed. So folks, I could, I could talk all day. There is so much that I didn't even get a chance to cover. Um, I tried to give you a whistle stop tour, as you can see, uh, it's not uh, necessarily straightforward, uh, but this is the work that this is what's happened. And this is where we see the solutions. And this is the work uh, that we in Nautilus are committed to doing. Um, and only through this will we truly be able to hold PO Ferries accountable and truly make sure that this never happens uh, again. So thank you very much. And uh, as I said, obviously very pleased to answer any, any questions. I'm sure there are plenty. As I said, I didn't get to cover everything. So maybe I'll get to cover some things in the question and answer session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. What a what a great insight you've given us there. I think we're all quite uh, taken aback of what did happen and what is happening now. And you know, the fact that people can be sacked in a nine second video is absolutely outrageous. And um, I think you know it was very notable how the government waved its arms and jumped up and down for a few days, but all seems to have gone a bit quiet now. So uh, do you think that was all a bit of show as you know is it all going to peter out and nothing much will come of it or do you think uh you know the insolvency service will come up with something to force because i have seen that some of the uh workers i think was it on one of the irish routes had to be taken back on board and re-engaged yeah so uh there, there were quite a few uh seafarers there as 91 that were asked to re-engage uh with the company um because uh they they realized that they couldn't operate uh without um, without the skilled seafarers. Um, so, so the, you know, this story will continue to evolve, right? On one hand, uh, the press have got their teeth into this. Um, so it may not be in the press as often, um, but there are some really um, uh, uh, sort of um, feisty journalists out there that are continuing to keep an eye on everything that's happening with PO Ferries. As you said, um, I think the next big event will be uh, the outcome of the insolvency service if the insolvency service decide uh, to pursue criminal uh, uh, um, prosecution um, or whether they decide to apply civil sanctions. Um, the one thing I, di I didn't necessarily cover in there, but um, there, the civil sanctions are around disqualification uh, of the uh, directors. Um, we have, you know, we've been making the argument that um, under the um, I can't remember the exact legislation off the top of my head, but I think there is a disqualification of directors. I can't remember. Um, but there, there is there is arguments there that um, not, not, not just aside from the criminal side, uh, but that the directors have acted irresponsibly as well and that they may be held accountable personally uh, for what has happened. So as I say, the next the next sort of um, the next big thing in this, the next big media uh, 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 event will be uh, if the insolvency service decide to pursue criminal or civil uh, in, uh, uh, prosecution. Um, in terms of the government side, the next big thing will be the Harbours Act and they have, it was part of the, the Queen's speech, this Harbours Act is what I mentioned in terms of the domestic legislation that uh, to expand coverage of the national uh, minimum wage. Uh, we have said today uh, publicly that, that it's not enough. Um, there will be a consultation on this and uh, we will be reflecting in that consultation that we think this that this isn't enough. Um, and we're continuing to engage with government um, on, on Fair Ferries, on our Fair Ferries uh, National Framework Agreement and engaging with um, uh, MPs from across uh, the spectrum on, on this agreement as well. So, um, the next big media event will be the insolvency service. Uh, everything else in terms of the political space, we will, will continue to go on uh, in, into the background. But that consultation on the Harbours Act is where we will be saying very clearly that we don't think government action so far is enough. And by government's own standards, it's not enough. You know, I think this is the important point. This isn't us just saying it's not enough. We're saying you, you said out very clearly that you wanted p &O ferries to rethink their actions. You wanted to ensure this could never happen again. Your actions are not meeting the standard you set for yourselves. Um, so that's going to be uh, the critical argument that we make uh, all along. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that. Uh, uh, but could we open up to questions now? If anyone's got any questions or comments, and then Robert will do his best to answer them. If we can ask that um, you keep your, your, your points as brief as you can so that everybody gets a chance to, to chip in. So uh, has anybody got a... 
a point or a question they'd like to raise? Have I bamboozled you? Uh, Robert, Hello. I'm, not, I'm not imagining this now, am I? But I'm sure that I've read in the press that the, the p and a lot of the P&O boats are not running at all at the moment. Is this, is this a fact? Yeah, so um, no. Um, so most of the vessels are now sailing. Um, mm -hmm. There are two vessels, um, the Spirit of France, and I can't remember the name of the other one. I'll start my head. Uh, but there are two that are ones in, in, in being retrofitted uh, and the other one um, was was held up at dock and hasn't been released yet. So they're not detained. Um, uh, Piano ferries just haven't released them themselves yet. So right. they haven't been detained by the MCA. There were three vessels that were maintained or that were detained uh, by the MCA. They mm. have all been uh, cleared uh, to sail. Um, the last one was the Pride of Kent, which was only released yesterday. Um, mm. So it it as I say, it failed inspection three times, um, but uh, was released finally on, on the fourth inspection. Um, so the vast majority of PO ferries operations are back and the vessels are back up and running. Um, but the, and, and I, I think a really important point actually on this is uh, because of the model, the, the exploitative model that PO ferries have moved to, um, it relies on crew changes fairly frequently. Mm -hmm. So there will be another load of foreign exploited agency crew coming into work in these vessels uh, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months time. And we've been making the argument uh, that the MCA will also need to re-inspect at that situation mm -hmm. um, to ensure that these, that these vessels are, mm -hmm. as I say, fit to set sail. I mean, I think there is a, a genuine uh, a worry and, and I, you know, it's not scaremongering. I think there is a genuine mm. uh, issue over, over safety, um, the safety of, of the crew, but obviously safety of crew uh, uh, then becomes an issue for the safety of passengers mm. as well. Okay, thanks Robert. Uh, Gina, you've got a question. Would you like to come in? Thank you, Robert. Um, this applies, obviously this is p &O ferries. Mm -hmm. The same terms apply to p &O cruises and that sort of thing, I believe. So p Cruises, uh, so it's, it's an interesting question. p Cruises uh, is a separate company, um, which is why you will see on all of our uh, uh, literature, you will see p Ferries, p Ferries, p Ferries, uh, because p Cruises, as I say, are a separate company. But on the wider point, um, there is issue within, within the cruise industry uh, of these low-paid low wages and these sort of crewing models. So a low p and, and I, but I, I should... Be honest here and say I'm I, I don't know the ins and outs of Piano Cruises crewing model, uh, so I don't want to cast aspersions on a company that I'm not 100% sure on. Um, but certainly we know that in the cruise industry, this type of model is used quite uh, frequently. Um, so yes, Piano Cruise is a separate company, uh, but the issues within the cruise industry certainly are quite similar. But in terms of the legislation, um, uh, uh, the cruise industry is much more difficult to legislate. The, the reason why the ferries uh, we can sort of legislate on or, or the collective bargaining agreements, certainly, and the bilateral agreements is because they're, they're frequently in UK territorial waters and they're on the same routes. OK, so so they're constantly going between the same port to port. The cruise ships obviously are operating on an international basis. So, you know, one season in the Mediterranean, one season in the Caribbean. So that's really when you're starting to look into um, international conventions uh, in terms of, of, of the rights of crew that, quite frankly, currently don't really exist. You have the Maritime Labour Convention, which does confer basic rights on seafarers, but it doesn't get into the specifics in relation to collective bargaining agreements. There is the international, the IL Low, the International Labour Organization, uh, minimum rates of pay, uh, which is very low. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of trying to, to uh, look at the issue of exploitative crewing models in the cruise industry would be a massive undertaking that would have to go through uh, those um, uh, sort of international uh, fora. We, 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 we take part in those international fora and we will continue uh, to um, use those forum uh, those for uh, to to push for for um extended rights for seafarers but it's a tripartite organization uh so it, it's the uh, government ship owners and and workers representatives so trying to get movement in that is is very difficult um, um but yeah yeah thank you i appreciate that um the other thing that more generally the posted workers directive um what's the situation with that at the moment with brexit 
I'm not. I, I I'm not 100 sure. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> I, I will. I will have a look. Um, but I'm not 100 sure. As I say, I'm not actually. I'm not our our, our legal expert in Nautilus. Uh, we have a, an in-house legal counsel. Um, so I can I can get an answer off him. Uh, <laughs> so far, yeah. I know Nautilus were involved. I think there was a dispute with the um people building the wind farms, the wind turbines. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. That, that was a similar issue with posted workers being brought over to work at. Uh, Oh yes, sorry. Yeah. Yes, I see what you mean. Yes, the the uh, I think the, the offshore wind farm workers concession, um, mm -hmm. which is which uh, is this sort of um, visa waiver. Although they say it's not a visa waiver, and um, that basically allows companies to bring in uh, foreign workers uh, into the offshore uh, wind farms. Um, is that is that what you're referencing there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I do know what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, on, on that front, um, the so the government renewed that in July 2021. Uh, it's to be renewed, well, it's up for renewal in July 2022. Um, we have been making the argument uh, with government, uh, with some MPs, uh, that, it, that it shouldn't be renewed, obviously. Uh, we've been very clear about that. Um, we, we have been engaging with the likes of Carl Turner and some uh, uh, backbench MPs, uh, and we're, we're preparing to, to be honest, PO Ferries has really taken up um, all of our sort of campaign work and political work. Um, but this is something that we have done some sort of low level engagement on. Um, and we have got questions into uh, the Home Secretary. The last I heard uh, was uh, it was a sort of non answer uh, in terms of not committing to anything. Uh, Ian Byrne, the, the MP for West Derby in Liverpool, I think it's West Derby. Um, uh, he did ask the question of the Home Secretary at um, uh, at, at question time, um, and she said that she would engage with him on an individual uh, basis. So uh, I'll, I'll, I, I do plan to follow up with Ian to see if that ever happened and to see what the, the next steps are in that. But as I say, obviously, uh, our view is that that needs to end because it does uh, undercut British uh, seafaring wages. Uh, uh, and the argument they make is that it, 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 um, there's a skill shortage. There is absolutely no evidence uh, of a skill shortage of, of British seafarers. It is because the companies don't want to pay the going rate uh, for British seafarers uh, is, is quite frankly the, uh, the, the honest truth. Um, and also, I mean, this is where, where we also need to, I suppose, use the, ar the government's arguments against them. If government are serious about leveling up and leveling up coastal communities, then they need to make, and also the government in the energy statement uh, just before Easter committed to a massive investment in offshore wind farms. You know, Nautilus is very clear you know, the, the transition uh, to green renewable technologies has to be human centered. You cannot leave people behind in that process. So if you're going to invest in offshore wind, you know, millions, if not billions of pounds in offshore wind, you can't invest in offshore wind and then allow companies to bring in workers from abroad uh, and undercut and not allow British seafarers to be able to compete for these jobs. It's, it's ridiculous. So we need to have, you know, a just transition, yes, renewable energy, but it needs to be human centered and we need to bring, bring people along with us. There are a lot of people working in, in uh, oil and gas who, who, who are soon going to be uh, out of jobs. So let's, let's bring them in. Let's bring them into to re the renewable energy sector. Let's level up coastal communities. Let's get people in those coastal communities, good, well-paid, seafaring jobs. You know, the government talk about a maritime nation, but they need to put their, their money where their mouth is. When it comes to being a maritime nation, you can't invest. You can't talk about investing uh, in maritime if you're not willing uh, to, to, to do what it takes to actually do that. We have a, a maritime 2050 plan, which is the government's blueprint uh, for 2050 for the maritime industry. And the government wants to be a leader in maritime. Well, that has to start with the seafarers and it has to start with, with investing in seafarers and not allowing seafarers and, and people coming from abroad uh, to undercut. Uh, wages for seafarers it's not you know it, it, it's about exploitation yeah our workers are being undermined and then workers from abroad are being exploited it's not right thank you we were just having a discussion among ourselves as the organizers and we were wondering whether people would be happy to stay in one group or split into two it seems so interesting hearing robert as a group that maybe mm. would people prefer to stay as one group yeah yeah or is anyone keen to go into two groups? No. No, okay. If uh, I may be so bold to ask a question of Robert. Please, um, yeah. Just for clarification purposes, Robert, and, and you may know the reason 
I am on here. I'm absolutely appalled with what happened mm -hmm. to, at p and uh, and I live just uh, beside the sea here in Belfast and uh, one of the ships was floating about for a few hours and I just thought the whole aspect of it and the way it was done was absolutely appalling. Uh, and I, I don't, I'm not sure you, you know this question, but I'm just interested in what p and is like now as a legal entity. If they are insolvent, is it a matter of closing the books one day and opening them up as another, as another um, entity? Uh, is that what? And I'm not sure the answer. I'm not, I'm not sure if you know the answer, but uh, we know what insolvency is all about. And you've mentioned a few times that really, I suppose you're dependent on the insolvency service to uh, slap them down, uh, for want of a better word, or put the record straight. Are they a legal entity in trading? They must be able to trade, but what is that legal entity? Um, yes, so uh, you're right um, that uh, they are they are obviously a legal entity, but um, that legal entity is across quite a few different companies. So basically, uh, if, if memory serves me correctly, and, and, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think they basically have a company almost like for each vessel. So each vessel is, is sort of a, a company and then they also have the ports, uh, which are companies as well. So, you know, PO, although we talk about PO ferries, uh, you're right, there are quite a few uh, uh, legal entities and, and they basically have the same uh, sort of directorship, but but they are uh, across quite a few legal legal entities. So uh, there's obviously complexities there in, in terms of insolvency that would, would require an insolvency expert uh, mm -hmm. to answer. But, um, but yes, you're right. Uh, it, it's not necessarily straightforward. Uh, because of uh, the way in which the company is is set up, um, yeah. yeah. The other the, the one an interesting issue that was raised or, or that was sort of mentioned um, during Pino Ferries was that uh, the employers, the employees, their contracts were in Jersey. Um, and therefore, uh, British law didn't apply. British UK domestic employment law didn't apply. Um, that was going about for for a few days, but that's just not true. Um, the workers, the, the test for whether you're covered by domestic employment law, it, uh, one of the tests anyway is a base test, um, which most of the seafarers would have uh, qualified for because they 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 lived in the UK, they were uh, entering at UK ports, they paid tax in the UK, so they were UK uh, employees. Didn't matter where the contract were based they were uk employees in terms of of the law but yes quite a few legal entities uh that penal ferries have and i can't remember exactly off the top of my head uh, how many there are but there are quite a few just one one final question do p and o ferries own Larne harbour um my understanding is that is is yes they do own Larne harbour okay. uh, as well as a few others um, I, I could be wrong on that, but that you know there could be some sort of lease agreement or something, um, which I'm not 100 percent sure on. But my, I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, fairly certain that they do own, own the harbour, but I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure on that one. Uh, they certainly operate the harbour, um, but I'm not 100 percent sure if they necessarily own it outright. And obviously, when you start getting into to ownership, obviously it does get a bit sort of uh, complex over what who owns what and all the rest of it. But they certainly operate the harbour. And this is actually sorry another issue raised in terms of the government response. Because what the government have said as part of their um, moves in the nine point plan in terms of national minimum wage coverage uh, is that they want the ports uh, to basically check uh, whether the ferry companies are paying national minimum wage. And if they're not, uh, then refer to the Secretary of State and the MCA. So the ports would basically be doing the police work and the Secretary of State and the MCA would be the enforcement body. But this would create the absurd situation where p and ferries would be checking that p and ferries are paying the national minimum wage. I mean, yeah. I don't think anyone around here, I don't think anyone in the public would trust p and ferries to mark their own homework, given what they've just done. So, you know, again, it's just another example of the, the unworkability and, and the absurdity of um, the government's sort of inaction so far. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Claire, did you want to come in? It's really um, a little bit off, off theme, perhaps, but it's to do with like the human rights and the commodification of seafarers' lives. And, and I was thinking about um, modern day piracy because we don't, we don't read much about it at all in the press these days, hardly anything at all. And I know shipping companies, they have 
like a certain kind of indemnity insurance for maybe six months or so. But when these people are taken hostages, they, they quite often, if they're murdered after the period of indemnity insurance uh, runs out, then that's it. But we never hear about these awful things. So um, that's kind of the other side of the spectrum, perhaps. But again, it's to, get, it's to do with human rights. And that, that to me is, is really, really frightening. Um, so that's more of a more of a, a thought really than a question. It's it's a really interesting point, Claire, and, and thank you for raising it because it's it's one issue that that we uh, Annie is slightly aside from Pino Ferries, but 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 not necessarily um, unrelated. Um, one of the issues that 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 we are consistently hear of from our members uh, and that we know is a major issue is sea blindness. Uh, this issue of people uh, of sort of seafarers being out of sight and out of mind. Um, so if I just put it out there, actually, it's worthwhile doing it. If, if people had to guess um, what percentage of goods come by sea into the UK, if you had to guess a percentage, uh, what would it be? 85. 85. I think 85 is a good, good shout. 90. 90. Say 90. 90, yeah. Yeah, well, you're not far off, right? It's it's 95%. So 95% of goods coming into the UK come by sea. When we surveyed the public, 2,000 members of the public, the average answer was 48%. So the average public thinks that 48% of goods come into the UK by sea. So what is that, you know, 40% by air? So, so there's a real issue uh, that the, the, the public don't understand and don't see the maritime industry. And, and we, we need to do something about that as the union that represents maritime professionals because it has a real life impact. And as you say, issues around piracy. And part of, and, and again, I'm glad you raised it because part of the work that we're doing in relation to, to sea blindness, we are going to talk about piracy uh, because it is a major issue. Uh, something that, that, that we've drafted a, a few ideas where, where hopefully we will be doing a, a podcast series uh, not just on piracy, but on sea blindness and issues that were raised. So uh, piracy is going to be uh, one of them. But yes, the, the issue of sea blindness has a real massive uh, uh, impact. And during during the uh, the pandemic, we saw thousands of seafarers who were trapped at sea, couldn't be repatriated, couldn't get home because of the pandemic. Um, it was called, called the crew change crisis. Stuck at sea for months on end, for years. There are still some seafarers are stuck at sea. So there are major issues with the fact that, that, that ordinary people don't necessarily see uh, how much we rely on seafarers uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that is something that we're committed to, to trying to, to achieve. And unfortunately, um, Pino Ferries has almost helped us in that. And it's, and it's unfortunate, uh, but it has raised the profile of maritime. And hopefully, we can use this to, to, to be a springboard to talk about other issues as well, uh, to try and finally address uh, sea blindness. But I'm glad you raised that, Claire, because it's a really oh. important issue. As you say, it has real life, uh, real life consequences. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Claire. Did you want to come back, Claire? Yeah, and, and, and on the back of that as well, like if you watch films like Sea Spiracy, the, the people who are, um, if you like, the, the international inspectors that go onto these vessels, they're quite often lost at sea as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it must be a hell of a place to work. I don't come from a seafaring background at all, but I did watch the, I did watch the film called Captain Phillips. Yeah. Um, with, um, what's his name? Tom Hanks. Okay. And that was so frightening. Yeah. Really, really frightening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Anybody else got any uh, points or questions? Something I was wondering, actually, Robert, um, <clears throat> do you have any knowledge of employers in other industries? Are they watching this to see what happens? Because if p and folks get away with it, are other companies likely to try their luck? You know, we uh, saw British Gas that they did this fire and rehire of hundreds of work, uh, gas engineers, wasn't there? Yeah. So, you know, are there other companies in the wings waiting and watching and... Yeah, I mean, it, it, obviously it's pure speculation, but uh, like yourselves, I'd be surprised if any weren't watching. Um, there, are, there, are, there is no shortage of unscrupulous employers uh, in the UK today, unfortunately. Um, so, so I think that's why it is really important um, that the action that government take, and, and again, that we work with the Trade Union Congress um, uh, in terms of closing these loopholes, 
Um, I, I'm, I'm fairly, again, I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, I'm fairly certain um, USDA had, had raised issues around lack of consultation uh, when their members were being made uh, redundant. It could have been another union, but I think it was USDA. Um, so, so, so this does already happen, you know, and that's why I think it's important that we in Nautilus don't take on the mantle of, of, of the changing of employment practices ourselves, because it isn't just an issue for maritime professionals. It is important that we work across the trade union movement. Um, to address this issue. Um, so uh, I'm not aware specifically of um, uh, employers that are looking at this, but uh, as I say, you can bet your bottom dollar uh, that some that some are, and that's why it does require government action. And that's why it is incredibly disappointing that there was no, again, no commitment to employment bill uh, in the Queen's speech. Um, this is, this is uh, let's be very clear about this folks. I mean, the government committed to it themselves. You know, this, is, this isn't just the TUC arguing in, into the abyss. This is the government said themselves they were going to bring it forward. So where is it? Yet again, government committing to things and not seeing it through. And we can talk till the cows come home about, uh, about government and our views on government. But the fact of the matter is, if governments say they're going to do something, we need to hold their feet to the fire and make sure that they do it. It's a, it's a totally different thing us trying to get government to, to commit to something. That's a much more difficult thing to do and very hard. But once government have done it, and then to say that, and then and then not to do any action. I think it's I think it's reprehensible to be perfectly honest. You know, um, ideologically, whatever. You know, they they can they can ignore things from an ideological perspective, and 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 that's fine. You know, it's up to people to decide what they expect from government. But when government themselves say they're going to do it, then they should do it. Um, it just it, it you know it's not just ideological. The base is government. Um, so anyway, sorry, I'm going on a, a bit of a rant here, but the fact is the government have committed to an employment bill, uh, they failed uh, time and time again to live up to their commitment, and that's why we need to work across the trade union to make sure that the trade union movement to make sure that they do finally uh, uh, live up to it. Um, there was just one other thing I wanted to say in relation to employers. I actually think if, and, and I'm not going to get into to naming employers or anything, um, uh, but we have seen uh, in the ferry sector a real sort of... Um, there have been uh, companies that have come forward that are willing, you know, it sort of goes two ways. Uh, it either encourages a race to the bottom and then there are those that are saying, yeah, we agree, we want a playing field, but we want a better playing field. Uh, we want a playing field that's going to increase standards and increase employment rights and increase safety. So in a sense, what Pino Ferries have done is expose um, unscrupulous employers um, and the employers that, that do uh, value their, their workers have really sort of stepped forward and said, you know, we're outraged by this as well. We want to see a level playing field, but not one that PO Ferries want. We want to see a genuine level playing field. Uh, we want to see British, British seafarers working on our, on our vessels. We want to see them paid good wages. And no doubt we'll get into you know, uh, disputes with them in the future. But on the very basis of, of this and on, on what I think is, is a real watershed moment, uh, there are a couple of, of uh, ferry companies that have stepped up to the plate and said that, that they want to see changes and good changes, changes uh, for the better of the industry. So. Uh, in a sense, we've seen it go both ways. Um, if I could just ask Robert, as, a, as an ordinary member of the public, um, you know, I, I only use ferries occasionally when I sort of hop over to France or somewhere or to Ireland on holiday. Mm -hmm. But what, what can I do? What can people like mm -hmm. us do? to support to support you know uh, yeah. the, the workers at PO ferries yeah and 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 thank you for that um for 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 asking that question um we we will be coming out going out much more publicly soon with the with the work around fair ferries um so because we've been engaged in conversations with government uh we we, we haven't gone too public uh, just yet because uh, we want to see how those conversations evolve but um we will be going public uh, with that with with what we're doing we will uh, i think uh, hopefully have um a call to action in the form of an open letter that people can sign uh, specifically in relation to to fair ferries in terms of the employment law stuff um uh, the TUC uh, uh, I'm told at the moment are, are in the process of developing their policy and then the campaigns uh, will come on the back of the policy um so i suppose uh, 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 it sounds a bit of a, a cop-out but really at this point i would say uh fo follow us on our social media pages um and just keep an eye on on, on what we come out with um as i say at the minute it, there are a lot of discussions going on uh, behind the scenes 
uh, which are obviously really important. Um, uh, but hopefully in, in the next few weeks, we will be going much more public with, with what our demands are um, and trying to really uh, energize the public and, and build on the back of that um, of that anger um, that the public uh, the public felt but uh, so I suppose I'd love to give you a concrete answer uh, but watch this space and as I say we have Twitter we have Facebook we have Instagram we have LinkedIn we even have TikTok if anyone's on TikTok um, so uh, so follow us on our social media channels uh, and you'll see uh, in the not so distant future um, some of our uh, uh, more public face and actions. Okay thank you. And obviously up to you to decide which very company you use as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks ever so much, Robert. Thank you. I think Lynn. Yeah, Lynn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Robert, so much. I'm really ignorant about, about <laughs> this topic and I've been really, really interested in what you said. I just want to make a, a very... Um, a comment to say that I think this is really um, hit home with the public because just an anecdote, I was with people yesterday, friends from a long, long way back who normally never talk about politics or anything. And this was a major topic of conversation. So I think obviously this, this has hit home and people have understood the issues and, and are really looking to see what happens. So yeah. That's not, not, not a very erudite comment or anything, but I, I just think that that's good that that says something. No, it, you're right. And actually, um, so so the 17th of March, I, I was in London um, uh, for work um, and had I was supposed to be going back home. In fact, I was supposed to be coming back to Liverpool to go out on St. Patrick's night and have a few pints of Guinness, which was torpedoed because of the no ferries. So that's another reason why uh, I was angry. Um, but, uh, but I ended up having to stay over in London for an extra night. And on uh, the train back to Liverpool on the Friday night, um, the, the, there was people behind me on the train, a couple that were talking Talking about piano ferries and I couldn't I couldn't help myself I turned around and had a had a conversation with them um, so you're right it does have public you know it, it has got cut through with the public and, and I think you know not to not to labor the point but I do think there is a where, where this was so shocking and the media did did genuinely jump on it um, but I, I do think we we do have to certainly in the trade union movement um, from ourselves and the RMT, I think we did do a good job uh, mm -hmm. in terms of getting the message out there in terms yeah. of trying to get what was happening. You know, we were getting real time information and we were putting it out as soon as we were getting it. So we were getting information, you know, out there and, and uh, uh, faster than the media. You know, the, 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 the broadcast media and the print media couldn't keep up with the information we were putting out there. Um, you know, we got out there with our asks of government. Quite a few of our ask government did actually do in the early stages, you know, the review of the contracts, the um, MCA inspections. Um, there's some stuff that, that we knew they probably wouldn't do, but we had to ask for it anyway, like end fire and rehab. We knew government were never going to move on that, but it was important that we put it out there and, 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 and set a marker. So, you know, I think it, it did have, definitely have public cut through. And, and as I say, that banner, I mean, I, 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 when, when I saw that, I, I was just so proud. And as I say, I'm a Manchester United fan, so I'm not often proud of Liverpool fans. Um, <laughs> but, but it was just, it was this idea of, you know, and also living in Liverpool, a city that is imbued with the history of workers' rights and the struggle uh, for workers and the dockers and seafarers and to see the Liverpool fans and, and our, our General Secretary, Mark Dickinson, who actually, well, he's not quite a scouser because he's from the other side uh, of the water, but he's a Liverpool fan. Um, you know, he got uh, emotional. He said that, that he had been left speechless by that show of solidarity. These were just ordinary uh, football fans that were willing on a Saturday against, well, they didn't ask for permission from the club. Um, they got it into the stadium, lifted it up, and just that show of solidarity was just uh, uh, amazing. So, you know, you know, these shows of solidarity happen when the trade union movement work with the public. Right, that's that's what the solidarity should be about. The trade union movement and the public working hand in hand. That's people part, and that's where we can really achieve things. And that's where we need to go from this: is building that anger, building that frustration, uh, building that public outrage, uh, and try and and get that 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 anger uh, focused into these campaigns for changes for the employment bill, but also for our fair ferries framework as well. Um. So yeah. Mm, thanks. 
Judith. Judith, you'd like to say something? Robert, um, I wonder what was the justification that PO were putting up for this action in the first place? And is it one of those companies where people in Dubai are accruing enormous profits? And is that likely to happen to other shipping companies who are making equally enormous profits, but uh, citing very high costs because of the pandemic and because of Brexit? What, what's your sense of that? Yeah, um, so yes, uh, so the, the first question, um, which was in relation to uh, uh, Dubai uh, and DP World and the, and the financial situation, yes. Um, so I was just trying to gather my thoughts there. Um, yeah, the justification that Pino Ferries gave was that they were in dire financial straits, right? And and, and, and there's a certain element of truth in that, okay? Uh, we can't deny that, that, that Pino Ferries were facing difficulties. But the fact is that we'd just been through a two year pandemic where people weren't traveling uh, on ferry services. Um, and, and I suppose that the other point that, 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 I, that I mentioned earlier is that it still doesn't give, give them an excuse to break the law. Um, so there could well have, have needed to be uh, redundancies. I, I don't know. But the fact is that they locked us out of that process. So in the past, we have been part of it. So in 2019, Pino Ferries made a, a round of redundancies and, and we were engaged in that process. Now, we opposed those redundancies at the time, but we were part of the process. And that's the point. Uh, again, as I said, we don't want to see a company uh, go under because it, it's our members that lose their jobs. But these are viable ferry routes, right? They, these are ferry routes that should be making money. Um, so I suppose the long term viability is something that we never even had a chance to really uh, participate in and look at and try and engage constructively with, with, with the company uh, to get them on, 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 a, on a fair foot and to be able to compete. Um, so there's that issue that, 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 yes, there was a financial situation, but, um, you know, the answer to, to financial straits isn't to, to break the law, which is what, you know, ferries uh, uh, effectively did and and you know there is a role for unions to be constructive in that process and look we're a union that prides ourselves on being constructive we want to be constructive we want to be in the room engaging with employers trying to work out the best situation for the company and for our members because that's when things happen that's how you, that's how you save jobs that's how you get better results um so anyway that is uh that's that that was uh uh, uh, not good. That was, you know, the, the company just ultimately failing to, to consult was no excuse for, uh, in terms of the, the financial uh, de de decision. Um, in terms of other companies, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure in terms of the, the, the wider issues. Um, you know, there is obviously, you know, you have layers and layers and layers. This is an issue in shipping where you have companies that own companies. You also have companies that own vessels that the vessels are leased. You have agency crew that are employed through an agency. So, you know, in one, in one ship you can have you know uh, the crew that are employed by a company the company that's leasing the ship the ship owners and then obviously you have the ports and, and you know it, it's a whole mess of 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 of, of different uh, companies and all designed uh to 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 lower regulation uh, and and create sort of um a beneficial financial uh, uh situations um so yes Look, clearly the, the, the point is that p ferries have set a precedent and it's a dangerous one at that. And so what the government needs to do is act to make sure that any other company that is thinking of acting in this way doesn't. Um, but yeah, so, so that's, the, that's, that's the fundamental point is, um, you know, I'm not sure specifically of any company that, that's planning on acting this way, but, uh, uh, you know, certainly that's where government need to act to make sure that, that anyone that is uh, gets the message and p ferries get the message. There's a, a very interesting um, story from Norway. I've written an article today on it for um, a shipping newspaper. And there's a ferry company there called uh, Horsey Houghton. And they sail up and down the Norwegian coast, visiting the fjords. And they have expedition ships as well operating internationally. And they've got um, a Labour-led government in Norway now, which they didn't have before. And they have said they will support the union's demands to have Norwegian wages and working conditions prevailing in Norwegian waters, because before an internationally registered ship mm -hmm. come in and be exempt from Norwegian uh, wages and working conditions. But now um, the government is going to enforce that. And this particular ferry company in Norway has said they will support it and they will pay. I think the, uh, 
the uh, ordinary seafarers will be paid something like forty-five thousand pounds a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, Norway, Norway is a high wage economy anyway, but you know this is quite a, a world away from the one pound something an hour that VNO is trying its luck with. Mm. So, uh, are there any other burning issues that people want to raise before we move to to wrap up? Any thoughts or observations? Does anyone have any questions that you've not got answers to or any gaps in the knowledge? I'd just like to say thanks, really. I mean, that was so interesting and, yeah, wonderful, really Thank you. passionate, Robert. Thank you. And I've learned a lot and got a lot of food for thought. So, mm. Yes, thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Robert. That was, that was yeah. fantastic. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for coming all this way to South Wales. It's a <laughs> yeah, so you, the wonder of Zoom. <laughs> my my uh, my mum is actually visiting at the minute, and she's heading down to South Wales tomorrow to visit. Oh, my mom. oh, you get South Wales? Yeah, Carmarthen is that South Wales? Southwest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. lovely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's mm. great. Oh, really, really interesting and engaging. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Yeah. I, a lot to think about and to watch out for now and to yeah. support you in your fantastic fight that you're doing. Mm. Thank you, thank you. I mean, the other thing I was just going to—I was just going to mention, I suppose, to, to sum up—is—is is, is the wider issue that that I, I thought about talking about and thought I'll just stick to piano fairies. But you know, as you guys know as well as I do, this is. a you know, a, a 30 year uh, a battle in terms of trade union rights and workers rights uh, in the UK. And we can't lose that wider sort of um, uh, context. Um, and, and as I say, my hope, uh, and, and maybe it's optimistic, uh, uh, maybe it's not, um, is that this, this can, this can be a turning point um, uh, that we can finally sort of rebalance uh, the, 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 the shift in balance that has gone in favor of employers. Um, although if you hear from government, you'll hear a lot of talk about flexibility in the labour market and what people forget, and I think people need to understand, is that flexibility in the labour market means less protection for workers. And, and it's shifted so far in terms of flexibility that, uh, that workers are just being left without any protection anymore. So there is a wider context here that we need to, we need to remember. So, um, yeah, but thank you very much, folks. Uh, and uh, as I say, follow us on, on social media and keep an eye on all of our, our work. Yeah. And uh, obviously, mm. if anything else comes up, more than happy to come back and, and speak to you guys again. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Allowing you to, to know about our next meeting, which is June the 7th. We've got two young women coming to talk about their experience of being a young woman in politics. So we've got Fleur Ellen from Clyde Cymru and Chloe Shavies from Labour. Uh, one works in the House of Commons, one works in the Senate in Cardiff Bay. So we should have two very uh, diverse mm -hmm. points of view, but uh, hopefully they will offer us some insight on uh, the world of politics for young women. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, Robert, we have a different theme each time.